this week, uh, TechCrunch is running the TechCrunch Disrupt Conference. And as has happened many times before in tech conferences, there was a bit of a controversy around um, sexual harassment and specifically some inappropriate content. Now, I don't really want to get into the argument of what is and isn't inappropriate content or how inappropriate or how not inappropriate the specific content was. That's not really the point. I think the bigger point, at least to me, is technology has a problem and technology conferences especially have a problem with attracting people who are not white male heterosexuals. So the problem has a lot to do with how people who are not white male heterosexuals get treated when they do show up at these conferences. One of the my pet peeves has been the fact that a lot of tech conferences still in this day and age do not have strong anti-harassment policies and don't know how to enforce them. Part of the failure and what happened at uh, Tech Crush Disrupt is really they, they were not prepared for this. They didn't have any policies in place beforehand. They didn't have any guidance for the people participating. They didn't have any way of uh, fielding and managing complaints. They didn't have any way of solving problems with enforcement. And so as a result, they were completely unprepared. My concern here is that Bitcoin will face a very similar issue. We're massively multiplying the number of conferences. So far, I have not seen anti-harassment policies. Bitcoin is one of those spaces that is very male-dominated. And as a result, I wouldn't be surprised, at least from my experience in the last 15 years in technology and going to hundreds and hundreds of technology conferences, if like in every other technology conference, we're going to face problems with sexism, harassment, possibly even sexual assault, and worse, in Bitcoin conference, unless we take some steps now. So that's my pet peeve. And what do you guys think? I have a lot of thoughts about this, but what what kinds of steps would you say could be like concrete steps to end sexual harassment and basically make these kinds of conferences a more welcoming environment for everybody, regardless of gender, race, and orientation, and all kinds of stuff like that? Well, actually, that's a, that's a great question, Stephanie. And unfortunately, the silver lining, if you like, is that because this has been uh, increasingly paid attention to over the last uh, 10 years or so, there have been a lot of very well developed conference policies that have been crowdsourced and publicly available now as public domain documents that people can base their own anti-harassment policies on. And the advantage here is that these policies have now been tested through dozens of conferences, conferences like the Python conference, PyCon, the open source conferences organized by OSCon, as well as the various uh, Linux conferences that were among the first to adopt these. That means that these policies have been tested with real problems, with serious problems, including in some cases, uh, sexual assault and rape. It's just a horrible thing to think about. If I go to this conference, am I going to be sexually assaulted or worse? <laughs> Nobody should have to be asking that question when they're thinking about going to a tech conference. And yet it's a question that I, I think a lot of women ask. And, and, and conversely, I think a lot of men have the privilege of not having to ask that question or even consider it. When my wife goes to conferences, I insist that she goes armed, always. And that may be a pet peeve for me, but quite honestly, I find hotels to be very dangerous places. And when you have a lot of professionals getting together and drinking, things happen. Yeah, sure they do. I knew this topic was going to come up on the show at some point. We haven't talked about it yet, but this is as good a time as any to bring it up. It's been really interesting for me being female and being around the Bitcoin community and just some of the experiences that I've had. Personally, my interests have always sort of tended to spaces that are a little more male dominated, like I'm into liberty and freedom and Bitcoin and atheism or skepticism. And so all of those things are pretty heavily male dominated. But Bitcoin really stands out as sort of the, the most, you know, 95, 98% male. And not that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, like there are great men that are in Bitcoin. I, I would like to see maybe a little bit more diversity, but you know, that's what we've got right now. I try to do what I can to tell all my female friends about Bitcoin and to show them how to use it, to help them set up a wallet. So that's just my personal soapbox, you know, to try to bring bring more people of all different kinds into the community. But going to a Bitcoin conference and walking in and seeing, you know, models at the booths, booth babes, as they're sometimes called, and being a woman, you do kind of get the sense that 
uh, this isn't really for me, you know, <laughs> this is for the guys to look at. And uh, Hey, I don't mind looking at beautiful women either, but you do just get the sense that it's not, this is not a place that's for you. It's a little unwelcoming. When I go on local bitcoins and I get a message from somebody who doesn't know me, invariably it starts out with, Hey bro. Hey dude. Hey man. <laughs> and 95% of the time they're right. I'm um, the 5% where they're not. If you go on the Bitcoin forums, that is not a welcoming place for women. There are a lot of avatars. There are a lot of comments and posts that just make it clear that women are not wanted here. This is not a place for women. You know, there's a little bit of a way to go. And unfortunately, the people who care about issues of diversity, whether it's gender, racial, or other kinds of diversity, those people who are really tuned in and caring about those things, um, you know, like they already get it, right? But there are some people who don't get it and they're probably like a vocal minority. Unfortunately, they can kind of taint a whole event with this flavor of discrimination or whatever. I do think that most people in the Bitcoin community or the tech community or the liberty community or what have you, like their heart's in the right place. They don't hate women. They don't hate anybody. You know, <laughs> they're tuned into these things and they want to make it an environment where everybody wants to come. It's just that sometimes there are a few people who are, are loud and not very welcoming. You know, interesting. I think that's really the key issue here because you're absolutely right, Stephanie. It is a tiny, tiny minority. And what has become evident from the application of anti-harassment policies, especially at places like PyCon and the Linux conferences, was that once uh, a couple of women came forward and, and, and talked about uh, sexual harassment, groping, fondling, suggestive stuff, all, you know, all kinds of things like that, other women started coming out. One of the interesting things is was it was the same people. It was the same one or two guys who were responsible for the vast majority of problems again and again. So this was repeat issues with the same people. And 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 that's bad news, obviously, because it, it you know it shows that some of these situations are repeating. But the good news is that once that was seen and, and having these policies in place, it was very easy to stop. Because it really was just a tiny, tiny minority. What that minority was was basically not welcome at the conferences. Th these issues really s decreased dramatically. So it's yeah. easy to fix, too. I don't know. I can see a little difficulty there, though, because it's like you don't want to beat an entire community over the head with this. Hey, you know, you better be tolerant of women or else there's going to be consequences. Like most people don't need to hear that message. It's just a few and they're not listening anyway. So what do you do about those few people? But it's not really about beating the message. It's about the organizers having a clear policy that helps mm. them deal with the issue. Think of it this way. Let's say you're an organizer at one of these conferences and a woman comes up to you and says, you know, something happened last night with this guy while we were in, uh, you know, one of the conference rooms or, or something. Like that. How do you handle that? If you don't have a policy, you have no guidance, you don't know what to do next, it, it gets really hairy. If you mm -hmm. have a policy, it becomes actually a very helpful means of ensuring that you follow the steps and you treat everyone consistently and fairly and in a way that's that's predictable and has been brought to the attention beforehand. And that removes a lot of the unfairness. I really think it's all about the policy and what that does for the organizers, more so than dealing with this as applying rules to individuals. This isn't about nannyism or telling you what you should say or not. It's about the conference as a private organization saying, look, these are the acceptable standards of professional behavior in this professional engagement. And we expect people to fulfill those requirements as a private organization. As the other Caucasian, you know, heterosexual male <laughs> here, let, let me uh, let me play kind of the idiot. I'm very evidence based. And when we go to these events, I've never seen anything that suggested any of this to me. And I've never heard anyone tell me anything that ever happened at one of these Bitcoin events. So so this is something that we're concerned about potentially happening. I mean, the booth babes aside, uh, I, I totally agree with you. You know, the booth babes, that definitely did happen. But outside of that one particular vendor in that one particular incident, we don't actually know of anything like this happening in the Bitcoin space, right? To be clear, nothing has happened to my attention 
that I have heard of. This is not about something happening at a Bitcoin conference and as a result requiring a change. This is about recognizing that when uh, lots of adults get into a place as professionals together, things happen especially in this kind of environment, based on our experiences, things will happen simply because they have happened at hundreds of conferences again and again. So things will happen. It's just a matter of time. My premise here is that if you have a policy beforehand, when things happen, you can handle them a lot better than if you don't have a policy. That's it, It's as simple as it gets. Okay. And I can see the argument for that. And I, I don't think I disagree with that. But again, you know, like the, the thing that comes back to me is, aren't these things that are we're finding reprehensible also illegal? Some of them are, some of them are not. You know, of course, sexual assault groping uh, are. Making an app that lets you stare at breasts is not illegal, right? Actually, it was was showing people's faces while they were staring at breasts. It wasn't the breast itself. But but still, yeah, I mean, making some things... That objectifies women, for example. I don't Nor think that's illegal. Nor should that be illegal. I don't. Nor should it be I, illegal. Like to be clear, like we don't think that should be illegal, I don't, or at least I don't think anyone here does. But yeah, I mean, I, I kind of agree with you, Adam. Of course, no groping. Of course, no raping. You know, like that should go without saying. But why is it still happening? Okay, so then this is more about just being upfront and clear about what the expectations are, even even regardless of what the rules in the real world are. This is setting the rules for these particular conference type of environments. Environments where there's lots of uh, yeah okay so right and and not just the rules for what is allowable but also the process for how to address an issue if it occurs the expectations of what will happen when such an issue occurs for example wh- what are the implications of doing something like that do you get banned from the conference at PyCon yes you get banned at LinuxConf you get banned for life if you pull one of those things now I think that's probably extreme but. Whatever. The point is, there is a policy. It's clearly understood by all the participants before they go there. And, you know, you have a choice as to whether you want to go to a conference based on its policies or not. So the solution here then is just to demand essentially policies from these conferences, which does not cost them anything to put in place. It just is something that they have to actually think about beforehand and then actually communicate to people who are attending. Right. I mean, that's the barrier here. Arguably, it costs them less because it exposes them to less liability than if they don't have a policy. Yes, and that's that's absolutely the argument. But the argument here is based on something else, which I want to make explicit. These things escalate. If you allow booth babes, you get presentations that are objectifying to women. If you allow those, you get people behaving more and more aggressively towards women, and it keeps escalating. What we've seen is that conferences that are permissive in such ways tend to create an environment that becomes more and more hostile, not just to women, but minorities as well. I think it's important to put these policies in place, not because we want to just make sure that we have a response if something horrific happens, but also to reduce these kind of subtle and repeated offenses, if you like, that create an environment that leads to the more serious ones. So we're trying to get in front of this, it sounds like, and try to prevent this from happening in the Bitcoin space by encouraging conferences and conference organizers to, in fact, think about this problem before it occurs and uh, to have a policy in place. I'm going to get way further in front of it by making an explicit pledge that I have made previously for conferences, but I'm now going to make explicit for Bitcoin. I will not attend or speak at conferences that do not have explicit and enforceable anti-harassment policies, because otherwise I would be encouraging exactly the kind of circumstances that lead to a sausage fest of a conference and a hostile environment for non-male heterosexuals. I think that's really brave of you. Thank you so much for saying that, Andreas. It's not brave, actually. Uh, Honestly, it really is not. It's an easy choice for me to make, Stephanie. It's a very, very, it's the easiest choice possible, which is why I think more of the public speakers and especially the guys in the Bitcoin community who think this is an issue and want to take it seriously, join me in taking this pledge because for us, it's easy. I don't think any of the conferences we're going to have policies in place yet. Oh, yeah, I know. And and that's going to become an immediate issue with the Argentinian conference because, you know, I'm still in communication as to whether I'm participating in that. They're going to have to put a policy in place. Yeah, no, I can definitely see something like that. Again, I I hadn't really been thinking about that too much, but I'll uh, I'll take a look at the conferences we're going to and and see how disruptive that potentially could be. So, okay, well, you know, again, 
I have trouble with things that I haven't seen. That's really my issue is that I really try to be very evidence oriented and, and I haven't seen anything like this, but I, I definitely but understand the concern here. No, I, I appreciate that. And certainly there are lots of oppor- there are more opportunities for me not to see it than for me to see it. But that's my only real tie up on this is that yeah, I, I things totally understand. scary. No, Adam, this is absolutely understandable. Here's the thing. I have seen it. I've seen it at hundreds of conferences, and I've seen it again and again. I've seen it in the atheist community. I've seen it in the Linux community. I've seen it in the open source community, and I've seen it in the security community. Adding up all of those experiences tells me that these are not isolated incidents, that these are not exceptions. These are patterns that develop, and they develop in all circumstances where you have a field that is male-dominated, unless the people in that field take active steps to stop it from developing. That's simply the truth. This is not something that happens to bad conferences. This is something that happens to conferences. Okay, well, I'm looking forward to seeing you know conferences in this space get, get out in front of this and hopefully avoid the problem entirely. I have a question maybe that we can uh, wrap this discussion up with, but it's kind of a big one. How do you think is the best way to encourage more diversity in the Bitcoin space? Or do you think it will just happen naturally? And are you doing anything personally to try to help that happen? It's a good question. I think that education is really the key. The reason why we have such a male dominated field in Bitcoin is because in order to appreciate a lot of the core advantages of Bitcoin, you have to have a variety of expertise almost. What you were getting at was why is the Bitcoin world mostly white straight men? That's a really interesting question that I don't think anyone has like an answer to. The first thing that comes to mind to me is an intersection of finance, cryptography, or computers. Those are both male-dominated fields. Now, the reasons for why is that because it's a cultural thing and it becomes a boys club and the women get pushed out? Is it because women aren't interested in those things and as great as numbers as men are interested in those things? Is it because we're kind of groomed from birth to steer women into away from STEM fields and so forth? All I'm of not, the above? Yeah, or all of the above, some combination thereof. For me, I want everybody to use Bitcoin, right? And I care about having a large community made up of all different kinds of people. So what I do is just try to tell all of my friends about Bitcoin and help them understand it, help them start using it. And what I find is that women are just as receptive to it as men. If I try to talk to them about Bitcoin, Bitcoin can appeal to everybody. It's so neutral. It's so global. It has the ability to just go into all kinds of spaces. It's not just for certain kinds of people. It's for everybody. So let's make it happen. Tell all your friends about it. And if you want to see more women using Bitcoin, more people of color using Bitcoin, more queer people using Bitcoin, tell your friends that fit those demographics. And I pretty much can guarantee that they're going to be interested in it. I think you can do a lot more in terms of increasing diversity within Bitcoin. Bitcoin reflects the rest of our culture, unfortunately, in that it represents a technically male-dominated field. But as people in this field, we can take active measures to counteract that. If you recognize the fact that money is for everyone, it's neutral, it's a human right, everyone should have it, and this is for everyone, then you don't have to accept the fact that because the culture is biased, you're going to take that bias and reflect it in Bitcoin. You can work mm. against that. You can actively work against that. You make hiring decisions, for example. So when you're making hiring decisions, in my previous company, one of the most important hiring policies we instituted was stripping names, ages, and address off people's resumes. So you had to judge them by their skills Mm. um, during the process. Only at the very end did you find out who the person was. You had to do it blind. And that actually resulted very quickly in an increase in women and minorities in hiring. That's interesting because there are actual studies that show hiring decisions are affected by the sound of the name and the gender and everything. Absolutely. It's basically recognizing that bias is not something that, that bad people do, Bias is something that is intrinsic to the human experience. Ignoring that bias or worse, feeding that bias is something bad people do. If you want, you recognize the bias is there. You recognize that even the most enlightened among us uh, tend to make snap judgments based on names, based on age, based on location, state even. If you want to cut those judgments out, you work actively to remove them 
so that you don't apply your bias. But you can do that in hiring. You can do that in, in the way you do mentoring and career development within your company. You can look carefully at your Bitcoin startup, your new Bitcoin startup, and ask yourself, are all my women in marketing? Are all my engineering team men? If that's the case, then uh, there's something wrong with your hiring. I don't want to prejudice this and say that I'm going to get a hundred thousand emails. I'm going to disclaim this up front. I'm talking about how I make my own choices. I'm also suggesting that other people may want to think about their choices. That's all. I'm not saying we should impose any of this on anyone. It's all about private companies and private individuals making choices that promote the ideals that they wish to promote. And that's why I've made the choice to not go to conferences, but that's my private choice. I'm not imposing it on anyone. You know, there's another point about that too. In a way, discrimination hurts the employer as much as an employee, because if somebody's discriminating based on something arbitrary like gender, race, or whatever, then they might miss out on a great employee and they could just go work for another company that doesn't have that bias. You know, unfortunately, in some spaces, everybody has these biases and People don't realize it, so it can't get addressed. But consider that when you're hiring, you might miss out on a great employee. As we were getting into this conversation, I was a little bit concerned that we were going to go the direction with it where we should be making sure where if you're in a Bitcoin or tech related company, you should be making sure to hire a minimum number of these other minority groups. But that's not what you were saying at all, Andres. What you're saying is that you're just modifying the way that you even go about hiring and how you, you know, you're looking at skills before you look at the people. If you remove the organizational, institutional, and subjective biases that you have in your hiring process, diversity happens, believe me. It may not happen as rapidly as you might like, and you're still going to get some of that cultural bias filtering through, but you're going to be able to shrink that gap. At the end of the day, when we're talking about freedom and we're talking about choices, the freer you are, the more you have the burden of that choice because your choice now has meaning. So make it carefully. Hi, this is Jason King, founder at Sean's Outpost, and you are listening to Let's Talk Bitcoin. Sean's Outpost is a homeless outreach in Pensacola, Florida, and we are proudly powered by Bitcoin. To date, over 13,000 meals have been fed to the homeless in our area, all purchased with Bitcoin and through the generosity of the cryptocurrency community. Read more about us at S-E-A-N-S outpost.com. Food, shelter, Bitcoin, everybody. Sean's Outpost.com.